Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This is us for a live stream number 71 being recorded on December 14, 2022. Uh, we had about 30 people in the chat and then we had a technical issue. Now we're back up to 18 in the chat. But um, yeah, we're just going to get rolling with today's stream. We have a number of things, uh, stories I pulled to follow up on from last week. But I just want to start out by chatting with the chat uh, who've been chatting away here for about a half an hour almost. So let's see what's going on. And I lost a little bit of the beginning of the chat, but libertarianism is like the state approved and curated way to rebel in quotes against the system while also licking its boot. Yeah, exactly. So package rebellion, um, it's, it's very limited. It is a way that you can get mad at the government without getting mad at the forces which give rise to the government, i.e. class society and the rule of capitalists. Um, you know, libertarianism being a kind of crypto fascism tends to appeal to um, ruined petty bourgeois or struggling petty bourgeois, people who remember sort of the good old days of rising capitalism and want to go back to that. It's a reactionary effort to go back to sort of an earlier phase of capitalism. However, you know, as with all of these kind of uh, fascist things, the big bourgeoisie is, of course, pulling the strings because really there are two great classes in capitalism, the big bourgeoisie, the really rich capitalists, and then the proletariat. Proletariat are great because of our numbers and the bourgeoisie is great because of their property. They command a huge amount of wealth. The petty bourgeoisie is sort of caught in the middle. They neither have a huge amount of property nor a lot of numbers. So to get anything done, they have to align with one of the other, you know, one of the big classes that actually um, are the main participants in, in the class struggle. And, you know, when they try to recenter things around them and uh, their reactionary aims, that is um, generally a, a pretty bad thing. Because again, this system belongs to the big bourgeoisie. The petty bourgeoisie largely resents the big bourgeoisie uh, because capital consolidates over time. And the petty bourgeois are people who haven't made the boat, so to speak. They maybe haven't been totally ruined yet and proletarianized, but they you know, didn't make it into the big bourgeoisie and so they're resentful. And so they kind of blame both the rich, you get some sort of faint echoes of um, class resentment, but they also are just as willing to punch down at the proletariat below them. And uh, they have no real functioning understanding of the forces which give rise to war and empire or police or, you know, anything. They don't understand historical materialism, the laws of development that we study in Marxism. And so you get these sort of claims like you can see it with Jimmy Dore. We actually just went through a huge thing on this um, on Twitter where he will go and stump for right wing militias like the Boogaloo's racist right wing militias, by the way, because Boogaloo uh, goes back to like a race war reference originally. I'm um, sure you can find some that aren't as aware of that or into that, but that is the origins and those currents remain. Uh, defender of Kyle Rittenhouse, defender of Georgia Maloney, lifelong Italian fascist, 30 year fascist. And so you get these sort of like, um, you know, willingness to turn to turn a blind eye to uh, some of the actual class forces and just like, well, look, they're saying they oppose war. So, yeah, and it, well, libertarianism, it's a terrible, um, you know, class blind, basically uh, substitute for actual struggle you're not going to really get anywhere with libertarianism for sure so anyway um how is it going it's going pretty good actually um you know we're in mid-december so you know it's definitely not as warm as it was a few months ago but um you know hanging in and uh you know the the darkest day of the year is in about a week and then it'll start getting lighter again so you know, we made it um, so far pretty good. So libertarians really only popped up during the George W. Bush years as a reaction to the growing anti-war sentiment. I mean, that was part of it. They definitely existed before that. Libertarianism goes back, well, they're kind of like rebranded Nazis in a way, but uh, although they'll deny that up and down, but um, that's part of the rebranding. 
I mean, most of the, their ideas would have been laughed out of the room as like, you know, you're just uh, utter reactionary, like Nazi-esque um, reactionary prior to that. But in the late 60s, early 70s, libertarians started coming out. Um, so you get that Nolan chart made by David Nolan. That's the four quadrant thing that everybody thinks is like the definitive statement on politics. No, that, that's the Nolan chart. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, the Nolan chart is like an earlier variation. It's basically still the same thing. That um, world's smallest political quiz and that political compass with the four quadrants, that's basically just libertarian propaganda to confuse people. And so, you know, this is tied in directly with neoliberalism and the conservative counter-revolution against workers' rights such as they were, whether it was, you know, actual socialism uh, in various countries that had had a proletarian revolution, or whether it was against social democratic measures in the capitalist countries. They wanted it all just walked back and, and to drag it over to the right. Now, I mean, during the um, George W. Bush years and Cheney and stuff, they definitely were out there. I think libertarians uh, kind of pushed really hard during the 2000s to have a moment, and then they did. Sort of, It culminated in the Tea Party 2009, 2010, especially when a lot of them got elected to Congress. Um, and you can see, I mean, they're backed by big money and they're really just kind of more, more extreme Republicans that took the place of the sort of, you know, um, the Bush Cheney wing, more sort of, quote, establishment, more polished wing of the Republican Party. Um, it's still basically just the same right wing garbage, though. You know, it's not populist or anything like that. Um, not really. I mean, it'll play a bit to petty bourgeois, um, you know, racism and things like that. But I mean, again, the bourgeoisie is pulling the strings. So, um, yeah, it wasn't just about the anti-war thing, but they did put themselves out there kind of as an alternative to the left. And I do think that libertarianism, um, stunts the development of a left, which is really, that's the function of fascism in any age. I mean, for the last hundred years, we've been dealing with fascism. And that is specifically its thing. It's not just that it's reactionary. It's not just that it's anti-communist. It is both. But it also um, apes socialist rhetoric and apes socialist aesthetics. In other words, it has a certain radical or revolutionary appearance. It uses some of that rhetoric. It uses some of the aesthetics of it. But the content is wholly counter-revolutionary. And, you know, as we know, as Marxists, you can't have developed capitalism, which they're all about, without war, without a police state to uh, impose private property laws on people. You know, the vast majority of the population doesn't really benefit from private property laws at all. And so how are you going to defend those? Libertarians uh, answer when you boil it down is like, well, we're going to privatize all the police services and security services for private property. Okay, well, you haven't abolished the state then. You claim to be like anarcho-capitalist. You haven't abolished the state. You've just privatized it. You still have a state. You've just changed the way that it's funded. So um, anyway, it's a fucking joke. But uh, yeah, I do think that it, uh, I mean, it, it got in the way of my own left development. Um, I see somebody saying that, uh, you know, they were kind of in that like green libertarian crossover space for a while. Yeah, this is, I mean, one of my criticisms of the Green Party, for sure, is basically, I, I would sum it up this way. We're in an age of a far-right convergence around the world right now. Anything that is not solidly grounded in Marxism is going to go fascist. And even some of the fascists are trying to call themselves Marxists. So they're even trying to, not only are they trying to take over everything that is not Marxist. They're even sort of trying to make inroads on Marxism itself. I mean, of course they can't, but this is the nature of revisionism, is you take um, certain appearances and then distort some of the major content. But um, yeah, that, that definitely happens in sort of the center right of the U.S. Green Party and uh, definitely in the Libertarian Party. And there is opportunism sort of between those parties. I've seen uh, many Green Parties have certain partnerships with the Libertarian Party, you know, and, and this is done on the basis of, you know, quote, we're both uh, excluded from the duopoly. Yeah, but on a class basis, 
I mean, the Green Party isn't entirely proletarian, but they're supposed to be kind of a left party. Libertarians stand for the exact... I mean, they're for... If you don't like the existing system, what libertarians are pushing for is this but worse. So you, you have nothing in common with them at all. The system that they're advocating for, whether they understand it or not, is going to benefit the capitalist class, period, like exclusively. So um, there's a... Con yeah, I was a libertarian there for a minute, pretty sure it was strictly reactionary because I was kind of a right-wing chud. Thankfully, I matured over the last couple of years. Well, honestly, congrats. Glad that you, um, you know, pulled your head out of your ass. You know, I mean, I've been there uh, when I was doing anti-war stuff in the 2000s. Libertarians were everywhere, and, um, you know, they pushed really hard during the 2000s. And, um, yeah, they, they kind of you know, whether it was the internet or whatever, it was hard to find left stuff in the 2000s, but it was real super easy to find libertarian stuff. So they're out there in your face. The paleo conservative stuff, anybody remembers antiwar.com that, uh, was it Justin Raimondo? Blast from the past there. Um, yeah, they were kind of trying to like own the anti-war movement, but then it's like, oh, we're for, you know, unregulated global capitalism. And you don't think that's going to result in war. How exactly? Oh, you don't understand anything. You don't understand how advanced capitalism becomes imperialism necessarily. And then unaligned imperialist blocks end up fighting with each other over colonies, you know, neo-colonies, resources, territories. And they do some of that fighting through diplomatic negotiations. But when those fail and times get tough, uh, they get workers to kill each other on their behalf. So, yeah. It's not really rebellion or revolutionary, <clears throat> excuse me, and the people that claim libertarian are usually very confused individuals. Confused indeed, yeah, yeah. Libertarians are under the impression that capitalism works without government, without thinking it through, for sure. Most of these people have never really thought any of this through at all. Hopefully, if any are listening, that last bit was helpful. So, um... It's always the hyper-libertarians that are in pro-government, quote, anti-government militias, a.k.a. foot soldiers for capital. Well, they don't know what they want. It's like, sort of, you get people like Alex Jones leading them with slogans like, the antidote to 1984 is 1776. Well, again, file under not understanding laws of historical development. Yeah, 1776 was the bourgeois re main bourgeois revolution in the U.S., Okay, so it uh, the the colonies um, rebelled against the monarchy in England, which was already um, sort of partially overthrown already, and established a capitalist republic in the United States, and um, that was a long time ago when this was basically an agrarian economy, and uh, things were just super different. You know, the the development of the means of production the class composition of society, you can't go back to that. So they're clutching at this phantom and just wind up winding up getting roped into fascism uh, because they, they've been convinced, it's in their propaganda, their ideology that is misleading, that's telling them that um, basically the republic, like the U.S. bourgeois republic, is the highest form of civilization possible. And so everything before it and everything well, really everything else, including, uh, you know, a proletarian revolution and socialism is a corruption of it. So they really see themselves as the city on the hill, which is this sort of anomaly out of millennia of, um, you know, darkness for humanity. They are sort of the, the beacon and uh, everybody else is just trying to tear it down because we're just a bunch of animals. This is basically their worldview. So, um, you know, the idea that workers would um, kick out the parasitic capitalists, depose them, and then keep running industry in our own interests, not for the capitalist interests, for profit, well, that to them is this sort of like, um, oh, what's the word that I want to use? Uh, you might say it's, it's a step down from, or uh, what's that thing fascists are, are always saying? I was starting out um, kind of drawing this out for comedic purposes, and now I'm literally blanking on the word. Backfire. What's the fucking word that the fascists always use? Degenerate. There you go. 
So, um, yeah, the Republic degenerates into socialism. And so, you know, everybody trying to, quote, tear down the bourgeois Republic is necessarily a degenerate. We're not acting out of rational self-interest or anything like that. Uh, so very, very elitist worldview for these supposed, quote, fucking populists to have. But that's basically what they think. I have a roommate that's in the Dugan rabbit hole. When the queen died, he was convinced the king would put Britain back on top again, lol. It's just like, again, talk about confusion. I don't even know what to say about that. I supported Rand Paul once for like a day until he said some Nazi shit. Yeah, Rand Paul, um, if anybody remembers, well, I was just referencing uh, when the Tea Party took power in like 2010 after the 2008 crash. That was sort of the first direction that things went in. And uh, then there was that BP oil spill, massive um, oil spill in the um, down in the Gulf. And it was, you know, destroying lots of coastline and wildlife and terrible. Rand Paul came out with, it's un-American to criticize BP. Okay. Joke. Just, just a total fucking joke. Let's see. The union president is trying to fuck me out of a steward position. I ran unopposed in the election, which was supposed to be the ninth. The former steward told me I had the job, congratulated me, and handed me the paperwork to turn in, which I did the next day. The paper even said unopposed. Now they picked two guys and picked two other guys who didn't even want the job to run a whole other election. Any advice? I mean, can they do? Do you, do you have any kind of bylaws? Is do you have any basis for opposing that? Uh, I mean, telling your story would be the starting point, but I mean, bounce it off of other people who support you. See what, see what they suggest. Any updates on monkeypox? There was um, a couple of limited um, breakouts recently here and there. By and large, it has mostly cooled off. Just um, search on Our World and Data monkeypox and it'll bring up the chart. But I mean, it's cooled off for now. The headline, though, is we had over 28,000 reported cases in the U.S. That is unprecedented, doesn't really do it justice. It's totally unheard of. Um, and with the amount of other things going on with respiratory diseases this year being way worse than any previous year, you have to look at something like COVID-induced immune dysfunction. We know that COVID directly infects and kills T cells, which is part of your primary immune system. Your B cells and your T cells work hand in hand as sort of the first line of defense in your bloodstream and everything. And, uh, you know, they protect you against stuff trying to get into your body and take it over. And... Um, yeah, so people are walking around with depleted T cells, who the hell knows what else. Basically, after getting SARS coronavirus 2, it wears your immune system out where it just can't stop working. And this is in addition to the T cells getting infected and killed. But also, you get this severe immune burnout. I'll cover this um, in the next COVID update. But it's basically like, um, you know, your immune system starts running a marathon and it can't stop and it gets really burned out. So people are walking around with really depleted immune systems after catching COVID two, three times now, even once or twice. Um, it can last for like a year afterwards. There are certain effects of COVID that seem to be permanent. So the cognitive um, impairment, that tends to be more uh, permanent, although you can do exercises to sort of, you know, we don't use a lot of our brains and there is some plasticity there where you can relearn to do things that you used to be able to do with now injured parts of your brain with different parts of your brain in some cases. So if you have suffered cognitive impairment because of COVID, you know, don't give up. Um, there's definitely ways you can um, fight your way back to a good level of like functioning that will be satisfactory for you. But nobody should have to take that hit in the first place is the point. Anyway, so we see things like RSV and we covered um, last week uh, strep A actually killing kids in the UK. Single digits so far, but this is unheard of. 
And um, so, actually, I had an article I was trying to screenshot. It wasn't loading properly. But basically, uh, one of the there's a story from the Daily Mail UK. Um, the headline is something like, one of the boys that had strep A um, died of the infection. He had been misdiagnosed as just having the flu, which, to be fair, a lot of times the general practitioner will see them and it's like, you know, I have these symptoms, I have like a fever, sore throat, whatever. What are they supposed to do? Like think it's strep A immediately? No. Um, but it doesn't get caught necessarily and then the immune system is so depleted. And this is not immune debt. <laughs> uh, that's something that is totally made up. The, we had completely half-assed partial shutdowns where kids were still going to the grocery store anyway. And this was like over two years ago now. Like that's been over for a long, long time. Um, this idea that people weren't getting exposed enough to common bugs and then their immune system like, you know, fell off because of it. That's total fucking nonsense, but it doesn't stop a lot of newspapers um, from running with that and even some uh, minimizer doctors. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's kind of the situation we're at now. So monkeypox... Like, why did we have this gigantic outbreak of monkeypox? The last time that there was an outbreak of monkeypox, it was like 100 cases. And, um, you know, it just didn't spread and spread. So why why now? Why, why did it spread so much? And why are we seeing many other contagious illnesses spreading now that we've just literally never seen anything like this before? Because we get RSV every year. We get flu every year. Why is it hitting people so much harder? Well, could it be that people are softer targets because of COVID-induced immune dysfunction? I would guess so at this point. Um, so actually, you know, I have a couple of COVID things. I, I want to kind of catch up with the chat before we get into anything, but just to do a really quick um, update. We were looking last time at, uh, I feel like there should be another update that, um, well, anyway, here's the current state of the pandemic. Does this look over to you? No, it does not. And you can see that there's a big spike going on. It appears to be flattening off. This is uh, this was updated two days ago, December 12, um, from samples collected during the week of December 5th. So basically, this is last week's um, data, but not all of it may be in yet and so when it gets updated this week anyway it's always about a week week and a half behind and sometimes the most recent uh update gets adjusted when the next week's data come in because sometimes you know there's like lagging reports but we're at the second highest level of sars coronavirus 2 in the wastewater since that summer peak and if it keeps going it may surpass it really you know since it came down from omicron in january February we had a lull, March we had kind of a lull. It's been climbing since late March and really just hasn't stopped. And um, you know, forget the cases, that's the sort of greenish line. We don't count cases anymore because of rapid tests and stuff. You gotta look at the wastewater, which is monitored for the virus that causes COVID. And it is there in abundance. And it's doing things like this. So um, real quick, let's let's look at something. Um, again, not doing a big COVID thing today, but this is from SIDRAP at the University of Minnesota Center for Infectious Disease. I forget what the RAP stands for. Um, anyway, COVID-19 tied to spikes in out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. So this is actually an old article. It's from April 7, 2021. Um, an international study that identified a dramatic increase in out-of-hospital cardiac arrests, OHCAs, preceding and paralleling the COVID-19 pandemic suggests that OHCA is yet another example of the virus's myriad multi-systemic effects and a signal of upcoming community surges. So anyway, they go into all the details about it. I'm not going to get it here. We've covered this um, a number of times before, and we've known this for a year and a half, maybe longer, yet, you know, what's going on? So actually, there is... Um, another article I was just looking at where it's like younger men, like athletic men in their 20s and 30s are getting heart attacks at significantly higher levels. Um, I'll put that in the next COVID update. We covered the story of Julie Powell, a 
this kind of famous food writer who was 49 years old, had COVID. This was a couple of months ago. She was writing on her Twitter that she was sick as a dog, like just wiped out. And then she recovered from COVID and then she died of a heart attack six weeks later. So, you know, we've covered this. There was a six fold rise in heart attacks in Mumbai last year. Um, the sort of COVID uh, cardiac arrest, you know, link um, and, and heart attack link is uh, pretty real. Heart damage, cardiovascular damage, microclotting, deep vein thrombosis, which is uh, basically clots that form in your deep veins in your body, and then they can uh, dislodge and then jam in another blood vessel somewhere else and block the blood flow and potentially kill you. So um, serious stuff, and uh, I don't know. But anyway, like I said, we're going to cover more of the COVID stuff uh, in a separate update. But yeah, so monkeypox seems to have uh, leveled off, but after hitting 28,000 reported cases and probably at least a few thousand uh, more unreported. So, I mean, where did that even, you know, the, we're in some pretty deep shit as far as uh, infectious disease right now. It seems like China really is responding to the protests by relaxing anti-COVID measures. Probably bad news for the rest of the world as well. I, you know, I really can't tell. I keep reading conflicting reports, so I don't know. Covering the SARS, uh, SAR, uh, so SARS COVID two, uh, coronavirus two, combining with MERS in the Middle East. I, so I've been hearing sort of conflicting things on that. I, I, what do you have on that? Because I, I have not seen a. I've seen various amounts of confusion, but no solid reporting on it yet. I've not seen anything directly about it combining. So uh, SARS-1 and SARS-2, so we're currently experiencing SARS-2 in this pandemic, are both coronaviruses, so is MERS. Um, and MERS has a much higher mortality rate of like 30, 35%, something like that. It's another coronavirus, but I, I didn't... Um, I didn't see anything about it combining yet. There's the potential for it to do that, but I, I don't know. So another comment, I feel like what got me into Marxism was identitive crisis raised in country and also clear enemy of state as Pakistani. I also come from bougie politics and saw how they perceived the poor. Since I grew up poor, I had strong dialectical materialist view. And when people called me a commie, I started seeing why Marx was right. Well, good. I'm glad that you uh, came over to Marxism. Because, you know, a lot of people really think liberal politics, it's like, no, we're going to get it right this time. No, you're not. The limitations of liberal politics are just baked into it. COVID rates in China are spiking like crazy now. Utterly awful. I mean, I did see they were at least temporarily relaxing some of the things. And I did see that um, there were a lot, like, big spikes of cases. Utterly awful. Why would you give in to counter-revolutionary demands from, like, 10,000 tops small business owners? Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Any thoughts on the fusion breakthrough? So um, I just saw the thing last night where they announced that today there was going to be an announcement. I mean, it's good news, but the thing is, um, you know, all technology under capitalism basically ends up serving capital. So we need to abolish capitalism. That's the goal of our organizing. And uh, if we want to actually experience the actual full benefits of these technologies and not just have them used against us by the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, then we need to, you know, take that power for ourselves. But yeah, I didn't see the specifics of it. Just basically that they had um, done the first reaction that resulted in a net increase in energy because it takes a lot of energy to do the fusion reaction and so far it's always resulted in like a net loss of energy i guess yeah they they finally 
reaped some energy out of it. Which is, you know, there's nothing that people probably won't figure out eventually. I mean, you look back 300 years ago, like we didn't really understand electricity. So, I mean, you know, who knows what kind of things we will understand 300 years from now that just are completely unimaginable today. One interesting thing I've been thinking about is that the online Marxist communist space is kind of finalizing its split from the Patsok and Mechatankis. What will be the next major split? When and what will be the anti-revisionist line? Well, I still see the main goal as pulling, quote, leftists out of the Democratic Party. To me, that's kind of the major task is um, too much of the left in the U.S., um, totally, utterly throws away its potential by tailing the Democrats. To me, that's kind of like issue one. So, you know, I sum that up as the fundamental task of the U.S. left is to break completely with the Democratic Party and with all capitalist parties. Um, I believe a left coalition is probably the next step after that, uh, as none of the parties are really big enough on their own probably to do anything and would probably benefit from sort of mutual collaboration. Uh, and then we'll see where it goes from there. But, you know, the last sort of few big moments were things like Occupy in 2011, 2012, Bernie Sanders in 2015, 2016. Bernie Sanders, I mean, I listened to a lot of interviews with uh, and spoke directly with a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters then. And, you know, Bernie had a like 25 plus year history as not at least formally being a Democrat, having at least um, some degree of ideological independence from the Democratic Party. And um, he was pulling people out of the woodwork who had just given up on the idea that anything could get better like decades ago. Now, whether they should have taken that posture or not is another story. But the fact is he was rallying people left and right, not politically left and right, but I mean, there's people just coming out of the woodwork to literally fill stadiums. But then he took all that and fed it into the Democratic Party. What could be right now if um, all those people had not been fed into the wood chipper uh, of the Democratic Party, but instead had been rallied to an independent party, the Green Party or a new Labor Party, which doesn't exist currently, but could have been founded for this purpose, whatever. What we know is that it wouldn't have been Marxist. I mean, Bernie's not a communist. But I saw that, and, you know, that was 2015, 2016, and it continued a lot of the themes from Occupy. And I think uh, restated them and articulated them more clearly and amplified them and developed them and brought it to even more people. Then again in 2019, 2020, and then that got basically aborted due to the pandemic. Bernie rolled over for Biden and again fed all these people back into the Democratic Party. And uh, yeah, so those, the people are out there. There's a lot of people who want radical social change of various kinds. Um, we need to rally those people again, but outside the Democratic Party, but in a way that's more permanent than an Occupy or something like that. I think that the good news is this will happen again, and people are learning lessons each time that it happens. And I do see overall improvements in the left over the last 10 or 15 years, like substantial. Um, the amount of Marxists, the people who have some kind of working knowledge of communism has definitely picked up since then. And so that's good. We need to just keep building that and keep networking, get to know your local left such as it is, fight for the left positions that you can. And again, you know, we'll keep redoing this and making mistakes until we get it right and you know we got to fight as hard as we can against the people who are kind of deliberately trying to slow that down and sabotage it and everything else um, people are fed up it's getting very very hard to live in the u.s things are insanely expensive the job market is ridiculous housing is in a complete state of crisis uh, so things are are real real bad and getting worse so you know we're seeing more of a strike and labor movement. That's good. But again, it's got to get a lot more organized, a lot more militant and more Marxist, if you will. I mean, more scientifically socialist, um, class conscious, 
uh, historically literate, you know, and, and able to move beyond spontaneous rebellion into sustained organized um, struggle modeled after things that have actually worked, adapted for current conditions. So again, I, I think we're still pulling ourselves out of many decades of uh, backslide and bleak, bleak reaction and counter-revolution. So, you know, I think that the turning point probably happened fairly recently, like in the last five or ten years, and we'll probably see more of an upswing now. We do have to absolutely keep pushing with everything we've got, agitate, educate, and organize. So actually, uh, there is more chat, but along those lines, this is actually kind of a good segue. We were talking in live stream 69, two streams ago, about the rail strike and how the squad had kind of fucked over the striking workers by siding with the uh, strike killing legislation. So I wanted to go into this because there's kind of a fight within DSA. Um, so this is from DSA North Star which describes itself as the Caucus for Socialism and Democracy within Democratic Socialists of America. Does that even mean anything? You, you, the name of your organization is Democratic Socialists of America. How do you have a caucus for socialism and democracy within that? Isn't that a uniting factor to literally everyone within the organization? Anyway, so you can see them uh, here coming hard against Kashama Sawant, who is, I believe, in Socialist Alternative, like one of the only actual, um, you know, socialists. I mean, and they're Trotskyists, so it is what it is. But I mean, um, you know, she's not a Democrat, let's put it that way. Um, she is the one who wrote the article that we read in that stream and made excellent points, actually. You can see there in the tweet from December 2nd, all but one of the squad crossed the picket line voting with the Democrat-Republican majority to break the rail workers' strike. A socialist can't be a strike breaker. This should result in expulsion from DSA. Failing that, the squad's betrayal of workers becomes DSA's betrayal. In other words, the squad just fucked over workers and joined with the rest of the U.S. imperialist government. Well, are there consequences for that action within DSA, or is DSA just endorsing that betrayal as their own. So if this fucking North Star thing, they got ratioed so hard on this one. I think it had like 150 likes, 450 quote tweets. But anyway, um, their statement was openly organizing for your ultra left cult. I'm sorry, please don't use words you don't understand like ultra left. So apparently it's ultra left to oppose um, strike breaking. Interesting. You have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. Openly organizing for your ultra-left cult within DSA is an expellable offense. Entryism is forbidden by our bylaws. Time out. So Trotskyists are historically known for using entryism as a tactic. That's when one organization mass enters another organization as a point of strategy. I mean, Trots are kind of known for this. However, I don't see that here. Now, Forgive me if it's going on somewhere outside of this tweet, but the evidence does not support this claim that she's trying to do entryism. In fact, what I've seen is that DSA has only really, I mean, I mean it's been kicking around for decades, but um, it only really kind of came back on the map after Bernie in 2015, 2016. And, you know, that's when their sort of sizable presence occurred. Um, and, you know, existing communists. Like, I'm pretty sure Kashama Sawant was um, a socialist prior to that and was in pretty much on the ground level. So sort of accusing her of entryism because you're mad that she's calling you out on, um, you know, giving AOC and other squad members, I think with the sole exception of Rashida Tlaib, a pass on voting to fuck over the rail workers. This is despicable. Anyway, Dis and then they use ultra left again. Disagreeing with ultra left positions on things is not an expellable offense in a democratic socialist organization. This is an ultra left. This is fucking. I mean, this is right opportunism, if anything. Ultra leftism. What are you trying to call ultra left? Like rail workers organizing for a strike? That's fucking insane. 
Um, so anyway, that happened, and like I said, they got kind of shredded for it. So this did not go over. Um, one of the patrons, and uh, forgive me, I can't remember who off the top of my head, did send me this. This is from the Seattle DSA. And this is, you know, goes back to December 1st. So they, they've been fighting this pretty much since the beginning. Three DSA members in Congress vote to ban the railroad strike. They don't speak for us. So there's a fight going on in DSA um, about this. Let's read this statement. So this is a statement from the Seattle DSA local council. Again, December 1st. And they ask that you sign on to the statement here. So if you search for this, three DSA members in Congress vote to ban railroad strike. Um, you can get that link there. <clears throat> so actually, if you do look at the statement, which we're going to read, um, it's got about 5,300 signatures, which is, I think, pretty significant um, for something that, you know, is not exactly um, going totally viral. So anyway, on Wednesday, November 30th, the House of Representatives passed legislation to impose on railroad, railroad workers an agreement brokered by the Biden administration and railroad companies. Unions representing the majority of workers on the nation's freight railroads had voted to reject this agreement and planned to strike starting December 9th. If the Senate also passes this bill, railroad workers will be legally denied their right to collectively withdraw their labor. Okay, and to which I'd say, do it illegally. If you let them, you know, if you just try to operate on bourgeois terms, you're going to fucking lose. But anyway... Although a railroad strike would certainly have painful economic repercussions, the solution is clear. Make the railroad bosses meet the workers' modest demands. Yet true to form, Biden and Congress are intervening to, quote, resolve the conflict on the terms demanded by capital. We stand in unflinching solidarity with railroad workers and ask every DSA supporter at this critical moment to sign on to the Railroad Workers United open letter to the Congress and President. So we're going to read that right after this. And so I also just want to pause here to say, do not put this on the entirety of DSA because there's significant amounts of people within DSA fighting back. It is a large national organization. It does not speak with one voice. Anyway, uh, we applaud Rashida Tlaib, the only DSA Congress member to vote no on this anti-worker legislation. However, we condemn the vote in favor by our endorsed DSA members of Congress, AOC and Cori Bush, as well as Jamal Bowman, who is a member of DSA. We call on these DSA Congress members to explain their votes to DSA, the organization they're all members of, and from which two of them requested an endorsement. When socialists betray the working class, it leads to demobilization and distrust of the socialist movement. If this is allowed to stand, we will turn away rank and file workers and hurt our ability to build a mass independent organization of the working class. We call on the DSA National Political Committee, NPC, to organize a town hall to make clear that DSA stands 100% with railroad workers and against the government's ban of their strike. The town hall should feature railroad worker leaders and activists and have speakers from the NPC and DSA chapters. The NPC should communicate clearly to DSA Congress members that we demand that they be present to hear these voices. The town hall discussion will also help to determine how to proceed regarding the vote of the three DSA Congress members, including potential disciplinary action. It should mark the beginning of a structured discussion within DSA, concluding at our 2023 National Convention on what we expect from DSA members elected to public office and how to hold them accountable to DSA's platform. As part of this, which again, you know, We've discussed things like force the vote. I think that was probably the last um, good idea Jimmy Dore was in favor of, last gasp of his progressivism. Uh, but, you know, forgetting about him for a minute, yes, it's in your platform that you're going to fight for these things, and then you're just pissing away opportunities to actually do that over and over again. Again and again, that's being done. And now you're voting to break strikes, and this is kind of a pattern now. As part of this, DSA nationally should establish a Socialists in Office Committee, which holds regular meetings with the NPC and is able to make binding decisions on legislative matters. DSA's statement, published by the NPC before the vote was taken, stated correctly that, quote, any member of Congress who votes yes on the tentative agreement is siding with billionaires and forcing a contract on rail workers that does not address their most pressing demand of paid sick days. 
The disgraceful betrayal shows how far Biden and the Democrats will go in siding with the bosses, even when the workers ask for something as basic as more than one day of paid family and sick leave. Only eight Democrats voted against making the workers' strike illegal. Progressives were, which again, you know, this is how the labor movement started out was illegal, and it's probably going to have to go back there. It, you, you cannot eschew all illegal forms of struggle in favor of purely legal ones. It's just that does not work because they will just make whatever is effective illegal. As based, you know, something like Taft Hartley is a good example of that. Anyway. Progressives were also able to pass a separate bill that would raise paid sick time to seven days a year, though rail workers are fighting for 15 days. However, this will almost inevitably face a filibuster in the Senate, quote, where the sick leave bill is certain to fail, according to Politico. This maneuver allows progressives to claim that they support workers' demands, yet in the end allows the Senate to pass only the first bill imposing an agreement and criminalizing a strike, not the separate bill for seven sick days. If there ever was a time for Democratic Socialists in Congress to boldly stand against Biden and the corporate Democrats, this was it. The role of socialists in elected office is to act as a bullhorn for workers in the struggle, not to sacrifice our ability to fight back at the altar of political expediency. And commenting on that, like, to what end? I see, you know, AOC, for example, just sliding and sliding and sliding. To what end? What are you gaining out of all these compromises? Anything? It just... It's like she she just got carried in particular, um, got just got carried away by the winds and just hasn't been really heard from for several years now. Um, I mean, there's like barely a mention of Medicare for all. <laughs> like she used to sell Medicare for all merchandise and then uh, that all disappeared out of her sort of fundraising shop and stuff. It's striking anyway. Rather than going along with the pro-capitalist majority in the House. Socialist representatives in Congress need to speak out against this bill and champion the calls by Railroad Workers United for public ownership of the railroads and paid family and sick leave for all workers. We asked DSA members and chapters to sign on to this call, demanding the three DSA Congress members explain their vote to DSA and for the NPC to organize a town hall with railroad workers to build support for their struggle and discuss how to hold our elected representatives accountable. So we're going to read that statement now. I just want to transition by saying this. Um, DSA right now is, I think, by far the largest organization in the U.S. that is at all remotely socialist by any stretch whatsoever. They are not communist, obviously, although there are communists within it. Um, but it is one of the main fruits to date um, as far as, you know, sort of um, mainstream uh, left organizing in the U.S. Now, we're going to have to do a lot better than that as time goes on. Like, far, <laughs> like, uh, you know, that that's, um, you have to look at this thing in terms of where we're at now, building class, con you know, where we're at now, where we came from, and next steps. This was a positive development, having a large organization like DSA uh, show up. And there are chapters of DSA that do very good, very useful, radical work. There's other chapters that tail the Democrats, endorse Democrats, and are basically just an extension of the Democratic Party. What I don't want communists to do with this is just um, get a smug sense of superiority, you know, sort of, um, oh, yeah, I knew they were just liberals all along. Yeah, we all did. The point is we're trying to move increasingly uh, to a more radical, more militant position. And if you are incapable of fighting, you know, whether we win or not, if you can't even fight within an organization like this, uh, what can you do? Well, you know, it'd be one thing if uh, communist organizations were as large as or comparable to something like a DSA. At this stage, we are not. Where are people going to come from? I mean, this is where a lot of people who have some kind of socialist orientation, some of it's wishy-washy, some of it isn't, um, are convening in a lot of places. Something like DSA is the only game in town, and so you get a mix of people from more Democratic Party adjacent people to much more radical people getting involved in it because organization and real-world activity is important. So again, you've got 5,000, uh, it's like, I think it was 5282 last time I looked, 
signatures on this many other people who um, would support this as well and who are you know everywhere on social media railing against DSA for this my point to you is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater there are thousands tens of thousands of entirely salvageable and correct people within this and when I say things like go out and get to know your local left such as it is network with who's there with the understanding like this needs improvement we need more struggle to build a better vanguard we need more agitation and education to build a better left etc cetera, etc cetera. but this is where we're starting from right now um you know this is the kind of thing i'm talking about so if dsa gets real big and then splits in half well even the half of dsa that would be further to the left like some solid socialists who would actually fight for more correct positions. Even half of DSA splitting off that way would still constitute the largest real socialist organization by far. It would dwarf any of the existing ones. So when I say that I don't think we have the party yet, I think people need to get out there, network, fight over different positions, fight for the correct positions. Um, and I think that in three to five years, after people network with, um, you know, find out who their allies are within these organizations, find out who their enemies are within these organizations, more lines of struggle will open up. And I think we will get reorganizations of various parties and groups. And, and I think we will get, quote, the party out of that. I don't know that we have it currently. I think that a lot more of this kind of struggle needs to go on. But the people in these organizations fighting for the correct position need your support they don't need you to just throw them away um and i i don't like seeing that at all personally but anyway uh so here's the thing railroad workers united open letter to congress and the president dear president biden democratic leaders pelosi and schumer republican leaders mcconnell and mccarthy and all members of the u.s congress we're setting sending you this letter to urge you to rescind and reject President Biden's proposal for Congress to force rail carriers and rail workers to accept a tentative contract agreement that has been rejected by four out of the 12 railroad unions. These four unions represent the majority of workers on the nation's freight railroads. So they may be a minority of the number of unions, but they're a majority of the overall, uh, you know, by head membership. By pushing through a tentative agreement that a majority of rank-and-file union members have declared completely unsatisfactory, President Biden and Congress would be overriding the democratically expressed will of railroad workers. While the tentative agreement provides significant wage increases, workers on the railroads have stated clearly and repeatedly that their fight is not just about money. Railroad workers are fighting for the right to live and have a life outside of work. The freight rail industry is structured as a non-competitive oligopoly that is dominated by seven rail carriers and operates at the behest of Wall Street, prioritizing the maximization of profit for rail executives and shareholders, even if it comes at the expense of endangering the broader public and irreparably damaging the supply chain. In the past few decades, the rail industry has adopted the Precision Scheduled Railroading, or PSR, model, which has benefited investors at the cost of railroad workers and the public at large. As noted in the Presidential Emergency Board Report number 250, because of this PSR model, railroad companies have reduced the workforce by about 30% in six years, have instituted attendance models which pressure workers to work through exhaustion, reduced safety and checking procedures, all in order to reduce costs and increase profits. So yeah, this is commenting kind of like, a, like everybody's on call kind of system and so you know that way they don't have to have as many um, workers because they just if you work for them you can get called up at any time in fact the railroad industry is the most profitable industry in the country however the billions of dollars of profit comes at the cost of railroaders being on call virtually 24 7 unable to access routine health care missing the deaths of their loved ones and the birth of their children and dying by the hundreds in work accidents it has also come at the cost of the broader public, as PSR has created a situation where there are not enough working railroaders to service the demand which the rail industry faces, making it a direct cause for the current supply chain crisis and a key contributor to inflation. The central demand of railroad workers has been increased days of sick leave, which has been wholly absent from the tentative agreement. 
It is for this that workers are willing to go on strike. Railroad workers have been without a contract for over three years, dealing with these issues without resolution and without support from the Congress and presidency. Urgent action has only taken place after the urging of big, big business, not of workers. Senator Bernie Sanders has tweeted that he will block consideration of the rail legislation until a roll call vote occurs on guaranteeing seven paid sick days to rail workers in America. We applaud this effort, but we also note that rail workers are fighting for 15 days of sick leave and that the U.S. is the only country in the developed world that does not guarantee paid sick leave. Under the threat of a railroad strike, which will cripple the U.S. economy if executed, the opportunity has opened up for all working people in the country to stand in solidarity with railroad workers and demand what we deserve, the right to live in dignity. While we are stuck at an impasse in the railroads, almost 50,000 graduate student workers in the UC system are striking for better paying conditions. We covered that uh, in stream number 70. With a key, key demand being a cost of living adjustment, or COLA. They're joined by the thousands of Starbucks and Amazon workers who have unionized their workplace and are currently bargaining for a contract by the Warrior Met Coal United Mine workers who uh, have been on strike for 19 months by the, wow, I didn't even hear about that, by the thousands of tenants who have formed tenant unions and are fighting for better housing by nurses and teachers uh, and various segments of all working people in the country who are all fighting the same struggle in different forms for a better world. As members of Congress debate amendments to the tentative agreement in order to avert a railroad strike, we urge Congress and the President to also take hold of this historic opportunity to empower all working people. As such, we urge Congress to adopt the following demands. And hold on, I'm just making a note of that. Warrior met coal united mine workers. 19 month strike. Literally, I don't think I've seen a single story about that. All right, continuing. As me, uh, yeah, so these are the these are the demands. One, public ownership of the railroads. To deal with the current supply chain crisis, Congress must take control of rail infrastructure, as is done the world over, and operate it under the public interest. So time out here. Um, that would be good. The problem is that you know when capitalist governments nationalize things, it's usually on an emergency basis, and like you know maybe during a war or some disaster or crisis, um, they'll nationalize stuff. But it's not really with an eye toward, like, as soon as they can um, reprivatize it, they do. So if you really want something like that to be permanent, you have to um, set up a proletarian government. Two, universal paid family and sick leave. The United States is the only developed country that does not guarantee paid leave. Our members of Congress have the privilege of enjoying paid family and sick leave, which must be expanded to include all working people. Three, pass the PRO Act and fund the NLRB. Congress must step up and ensure that the right to organize for working people is protected through the passage of the PRO Act and also ensure that the NLRB is properly funded to accommodate the sharp increase in unionization. Sincerely, Railroad Workers United. Now, I think um, especially two is a great demand. Uh, one is also a good demand, very good demand. Um, as far as the PRO Act and the NLRB, uh, a lot of union militants say that in many ways the NLRB is overrated, that the real source of power is organized workers on the shop floor uh, being able to execute industrial actions, you know, various job actions, slowdowns, shutdowns, walk-offs, so all kinds of stuff. You know, it's not just striking. There's many things um, short of a strike which are also effective, uh, but can only be done by, you know, even if workers aren't formally recognized as a union, workers who are working with each other consciously um, and, you know, have a union even if the employer hasn't recognized it yet. So that, that one, to me, these are kind of two and a half um, good demands. Yes, the NLRB, the NLRB rather, um, needs to be funded, and especially for cases where employers um, unjustly fire union activists and things like that. We need to make it easier to form unions and things like that. But ultimately, you know, you do walk this line of legal uh, union action and illegal union action, right now, and really since World War II and Taft-Hartley, the capitalists have labor so penned in with like, everything is illegal. The, um, the laws are so, so stacked um, towards 
capitalist. It's it's like insane, um, even compared to basically any other capitalist country. Just the labor laws in the United States are so fucked up. So um, the PRO Act, I think, and funding the NLRB in a way is a drop in the bucket. We need like I think much sharper action on that with regard to both labor law and also sort of the labor movement understanding that labor law only sort of um, goes so far, you know, uh, we may or may not recognize the jurisdiction of the capitalists to tell us uh, whether we can strike or not. And again, you know, like I was saying before, evaluate this in terms of where we're coming from, where we are now and where we need to go. How do we keep taking steps? Like if you're already in a Marxist organization and, you know, that's great. There's a lot of people who have not yet seen the need for it. Like from their point of view, from their understanding of class struggle and their own class position, they don't see that as necessary. Now, you and I see that as like we're communists, okay? There's a lot of people out there who could become a communist in two or three years, but aren't yet. Our question is, how do we get people who are vaguely over on the left and learning to complete that and, you know, not join the Democratic Party? So that's what we want to do to keep this constructive again, sort of, you know, not throwing this out, uh, baby out with the bathwater kind of thing when it comes to criticizing uh, an organization. So, you know, we see this with like CPUSA um, tailing the Dems. We have the same problem with DSA. A lot of people will mock CPUSA for sort of like, are you just a caucus of DSA or whatever? That said, the rank and file a lot of times have, you know, completely different views. And the same is true, uh, maybe to a lesser extent, in DSA. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we do have to support people actually fighting for better positions to build the movement so that, again, maybe we do get the party after a reshuffling, you know, three to five years from now, I'd love to see that. I would love for there to be a party that I can just say, yep, I think we've done it. Go join this. Uh, I don't I don't don't think we're there yet. So anyway, uh, one more article on this topic of the rail thing. So now this is from More Perfect Union. So this is affiliated with Bernie Sanders and, you know, to a lesser extent with the Democratic Party. So take it with that grain of salt. Also, this is Jonah Furman writing this. And this was today. So this is kind of breaking news. Uh, I don't know if we're going to read the whole thing, but Jonah Furman, the reason I said that name, he, I believe, was the guy in the article that we read who had the sort of weakest positions and was sort of mocking Marxists and things like that. This is exactly the kind of person that we need to be fighting against. And you know what the thing is? We can fight against and win against these people. You know, communist labor unions in the U.S., when? When we organize them. And that means... You know, if you don't think you can win a fight with DSA liberals, who do you think you can win a fight with? So we need to, uh, you know, win control, political control within all these various organizations. Uh, there are certain organizations that are completely unsuitable for such struggle. Example, the Democratic Party itself, totally dominated by capitalist money. But there's many others, you know, um, like the L.A. Tenants Union. A lot of communists uh, in, you know, sort of in leadership positions within that uh, organization, I'm told. So, you know, we can get ourselves uh, into influential and powerful positions within the left and then go from there. So, you know, you don't like seeing um, Democratic Party adjacent people get in there and fight um, and, you know, see what happens. Take notes. You will learn a lot in the process. But this is a fight that needs to be won. Um, as we struggle to set up, you know, sort of parallel uh, workers organization. So anyway, rail workers oust union president who backed labor deal. Eddie Hall, a working engineer who pushed for a more aggressive stance in contract showdown, wins an upset victory to lead the major rail union BLET. So some good news there. So they got rid of um, the old uh, union brass there. And this new guy who apparently was fighting for, I don't uh, know who this person is, but was apparently fighting for better positions, got the leadership role. Okay, seems like good news so far. So 
In a stunning upset, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, the 28,000-member Union of Railroad Workers, has elected a new president. Eddie Hall, a local officer out of Division 28 in Tucson, Arizona, won against incumbent Dennis Pierce with 53% of the membership-wide vote. Hall will take office on January 1st, pending official certification of the results, and will lead the larger of the two unions that make up the Teamsters Rail Conference. The surprise victory is the latest fallout from a national freight rail showdown in which some 60,000 rail workers had a contract imposed on them. In the BLET, the second largest union involved in negotiations, members ratified a deal, but many members were unhappy with the outcome. In an interview, Hall said that his election spoke to rank-and-file frustrations that leadership failed to listen to the membership throughout the negotiations. Quote, we have a union, but members aren't involved, he said. I'm hoping to get out and listen to the membership. The BLET was one of three unions that came within hours of striking in September before reaching a last-minute tentative agreement with heavy involvement from the Biden White House and Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh. In June, the BLET took a strike vote, its first such national vote in over a decade. Members returning ballots voted 99.5% in favor of striking. For months, the BLET and other unions had pushed for 15 paid sick days for rail workers. Currently, railroaders get none. In those final hours before their strike deadline on September 15, the union agreed to accept three unpaid sick days. Three unpaid sick days with 30 days notice, which are only valid to be used on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. With uh, Dennis Pierce standing next to him in the Oval Office, Joe Biden told the press, quote, they feel good. These guys, by the way, they're still standing, but they should be home in bed. 20 straight hours of negotiations. I want to thank business, of course he thanks business first, and labor. Pierce then advocated for his membership to support the deal. Contracts between the railroads and their employees have never had sick time, he said in a separate interview. There are a lot of industries that don't have that in their contract. Okay, sounds like he's the wrong guy in charge of winning new rights for people. That's a terrible reasoning. Asked if he would support the deal, Pierce replied, I probably would. Pierce was indeed able to get the contract ratified, but it may have cost him his job. The new rail union leader. Eddie Hall is a working engineer on the Union Pacific Railroad based in Tucson, Arizona. He's worked on the rails for 28 years and has been a local union officer for the past 12. He says he never considered trying to move up in the union ranks until last fall. As members grew frustrated with the stalled negotiations process, Hall's District 28 held a meeting where they voted to send a letter to Dennis Pierce asking him to come down and, for back, lack of a better word, explain himself. Pierce headed to Tucson in February of this year, and members weren't satisfied with his responses. That's when the district nominated Eddie Hall to run for BLET president. Maybe we will read this whole thing after all. What started as frustration over the length of negotiations, which began in late 2019 and meant, among other things, deferred raises, soon became about getting time off the job. In 2020, just before the start of the pandemic, Union Pacific implemented a new attendance policy that harshly penalized workers for taking time off, time that was already unpaid. In early 2022, BNSF also announced a new policy, dubbed High Viz, that similarly threatened rail workers' jobs if they didn't keep up with the grueling work schedule. These policies were part of the broader, precision-scheduled railroading regime that railroad companies have implemented across the industry, cutting jobs and increasing the pressure on those workers who remain. Pierce spoke out publicly about the attendance policies, hauling, calling high viz quote, the worst and most egregious attendance policy ever adopted by any rail carrier. In May, BNSF made some tweaks, which Pierce dismissed as little more than fluff. Pressure mounted on leadership to win something in negotiations to address quality of life and time off the job. The unions pushed through the Railway Labor Act process, through mediation, and into a Biden-appointed presidential emergency board. The PEB's recommendation, which traditionally forms the basis for a tentative agreement, didn't include any sick time. Pierce said his priority was to pass the deal despite indignation among members. Quote, that doesn't mean a lot of our employees didn't want to strike because they're angry. 
Pierce told Bloomberg in September. Now our job is to get out there and explain to them what we were able to accomplish that can help improve their lives, help the families, and get this thing ratified. So in other words, we didn't do what you wanted, but we're trying to convince you that the crumbs we gave you are good enough. That is... I mean, if, damned if this isn't like the Democratic Party's whole line and it's the sellout unions line as well. We need good unions led by fucking communists. Hall was able to win his place on the ballot by securing 5% of the convention delegates at October's nominating convention. That gave him access to a membership email list and he started making his case directly. For him, the members had already spoken. Quote, it is clear to me that the national membership is dissatisfied with our leadership and the decisions made by them when it comes to the national agreement, wrote Hall. Polls were taken, resulting in over 99% of those that responded instructing our leaders to withdraw from service if an agreement couldn't be reached on our quality of life issues. Well, that's pretty clear. However, once all provisions under the Railway Labor Act were exhausted and a legal strike was warranted, our leaders chose to bury their heads in the sand. You will now hear the political posturing and grandstanding on what a great job they did, and that it is now time for the membership to decide. I believe the membership made their decision a long time ago. Dennis R. Pierce just didn't listen. So commenting, this is what I've been saying about, um, we need to totally turn over the unions such as they are. We need fresh militancy, um, radical approaches to the entire process. We need to build worker power, uh, and that power, obviously, in the short term under capitalism can be used for whatever we want, quality of life issues, pay, scheduling, whatever it is, and then you ultimately build enough power that you can depose the uh, industry heads entirely and run this thing by and for workers, but it starts by building power. That's what it's all about. Just getting started. Pierce has held the BLET's presidency since 2010, and according to Hall, has never faced a contested election. This is despite a successful campaign within the union in 2006 to win direct elections of national officers, a right members of a minority of national unions enjoy. Again, we need, uh, we need uh, basically new unions at this point. Um, through the BLAT tentative agreement vote, or sorry, though the BLAT tentative agreement vote passed with a reported 55% approval, Hall says it was less about the merits of the agreement and more about getting it over with. Quote, members are definitely not happy with leadership, says Hall. The agreement process, it's been so long, many just wanted to get that process over with, so they voted for it. A third of the members didn't even vote. Members we spoke with agreed, quote, we knew the outcome with Congress. Some thought the PEB would be enforced. Many just wanted their back pay sooner, said one 20-year engineer, speaking on conditions of anonymity for fear of retaliation. There was also a push by the unions to vote yes. They always sold the contract. It's the best we will get, they said. That's what the union says with every contract. Ross Gruders, a BLET member and co-chair of Cross Union Rail Workers Unit, Railroad Workers United is hopeful about the results. Quote, people wanted to see change within our union. People are ready to fight, and we got to get organized in order to do that. That wasn't going to happen under the leadership of Dennis Pierce. Though results won't officially be certified for a few days, Hall is making plans. Quote, I'm hoping to get out and listen to the membership. I'm going to be the president who flies to San Antonio, rents a car, goes over to Laredo, to Corpus Christi, up to Austin. I want to see what the membership is saying and try to get the membership involved. We have a union, but they're not involved. Leadership is not out there basically rallying our members. They need that out there, not once every 10 years. To me, says Hall, this is just where we're getting started. So there you go. Um, there's the article. And good, I hope that uh, Hall proves to actually be a more militant change. And I hope that this spreads throughout. Again, this is a process we're going to be probably fighting for a few decades. Um, and we need to give it everything that we've got because Lord knows the fucking boomers before us, um, you know, and a lot of Gen X as well, um, dropped the ball on this. You know, it just the decline in unionization through the 70s, 80s, 90s, like it's why we are where we are and it's why the right wing is so emboldened to do all the shit that they've been doing to us so anyway 
Let's take just a moment and thank the patrons, patreon.com slash socialism for all. Uh, we appreciate all the support. I would make some kind of content even if nobody paid, but this support allows me to do this instead of uh, seeking out wage work all the time. So it's allowed me to spend more time on the channel um, with that financial support. So it's much appreciated and we don't run ads or anything. I believe that uh, communist media should be non-commercial, um, so we don't do ads or sponsorships. Uh, but yeah, the patron support really does help. Also, engagement counts, like, share, subscribe. That helps YouTube to uh, recommend this content to more people. We're growing at about 500 subscribers a month, which is great, and we want to just keep seeing that grow and grow uh, to basically match the growth of the left as well, not just in the U.S., but wherever people are, um, are listening to this. All right, so let's get back into the chat. That was uh, some of the articles I had pulled about this. So anyway... All right, so right there, um, this is the, the person who was talking about their union election earlier. The union president is trying to fuck me out of a steward position. Oh, no, wait a minute. Did the chat get, uh, or did this get reposted? I think, yeah, I think that just got reposted. But anyway, um, I'd be interested, Jakar, in your, um, your follow-up on that. I got my booster finally. Good. You're probably going to need it. I feel like we need to talk about psychology schools of thought through a Marxist lens again, as it's pretty clear behavior is not just a product of material conditions, but can be used to de-radicalize and prevent class consciousness. Um, yeah, I mean, so um, material conditions and ideology have a dialectical relationship. Material conditions are primary but they give rise to ideology and then ideology in turn influences behavior. So yeah, um, as far as, you know, psych psychology schools of thought through a Marxist lens, that's a much bigger conversation. Um, we would need like a lot more of a specific guide to get into that. I mean, guide in terms of a discussion prompt. <clears throat> Fascism only, quote, replaces the state insofar as the specific individuals and organizations of the state are changed, and they're changed to the direct agents of the most reactionary bourgeois. Yeah, so this is like what we went through a couple months ago about, oh, does Marjorie Taylor Greene, like arch reactionary, actually want to defund the FBI? No. I mean, the whole thing with the um, fascist assertions of the, quote, deep state, this is a term that they use... <clears throat> just to root out people who aren't specifically loyal to them. Do they want some kind of draconian law enforcement mechanism? Yeah, absolutely. But um, they just don't want the specific one, which isn't directly loyal to the absolute most reactionary among them. They want one that is directly a product of the fascist movement. Trump did this um, to a great extent. I mean, firing people, not appointing people, and then appointing utter fucking wingnuts. Uh, I mean, the normal, quote, you know, professional managers of empire are bad enough. This is bringing you something even worse than that. So, yeah. They're, they don't... I, I got into a weird thing about this. Um, I think it was Jason Unruh was posting on Twitter about um, how Trump, you know, basically is trying to, like... Um, step around or, or, you know, bypass provisions of the Constitution so that he can be president again. I forget the specifics. Um, somebody's like, well, the Constitution's bourgeois trash anyway. Yeah, but the point is that even that is too restrictive for Trump. That's sort of the, the point that you're missing there. And this person got into a weird heated, are you defending the U.S. Constitution? I'm like, buddy. They're like, that's some Alex Jones tier shit. And I'm like, buddy, you're missing the point. It's not that Trump, like, is some freedom fighter. Trump, if he were to get rid of the Constitution, would literally replace it with something worse. So, um, yeah, and again, it's exactly like the, quote, defund the FBI thing from Republicans, just specifically because they went after Trump, not because they're opposed in principle to, like, anything that the FBI stands for. So, yeah. 
Libs are trying to treat the symptoms of capitalism but don't recognize that if they abolish capitalism, our problems would be solved. It's like trying to cure coughing blood when you have cancer. Yeah, so um, this is what we say about liberals anti-fascism being shallow and superficial because liberals support capitalism. And capitalism is an unstable system. It's inherently volatile and uh, it's also inherently turns into imperialism as well. So if you're defending capitalism, you're defending a system which must commit atrocities in order to maintain itself, particularly as it becomes unstable. Periodically, the boom and bust cycle is based in, baked into capitalism. And um, when capitalism goes into real crisis, for example, after a world war, and um, there is a lot of socialist revolutionary organizing going on, they have to roll out a movement to stop that and to put a decoy socialist movement out there. That would be fascism. And um, you know, not that fascism, fascism is socialist at all. This is what, what we were talking about. It sort of um, takes on some of the appearance of some elements of it, but its content is entirely counter-revolutionary and, and reactionary. So yeah, liberals will um, sometimes claim a certain extent of anti-fascism, but they fundamentally are stumping for the system which requires the fascism. So, you know, when push comes to shove, who do the liberals side with? A few of them will side with socialists, but uh, far, far, far too many of them. In the end, despite their protestations, despite their distaste for fascism, need to preserve capitalism, and if that's, you know, fascism is what it takes, uh, they're going to look the other way. So, you know, when it comes down to uh, socialism or fascism, it, majority of liberals will go with uh, fascism. Now, you know, all that said, and that is true, there's a lot of working people who would be called, you know, liberals. They've sort of adopted that ideology. Uh, they haven't been radicalized yet. Those people, you know, have the potential for more. So again, you know, don't dismiss uh, all you know, uh, working class people who have adopted some kind of bourgeois ideology that is extensive in the U.S. We're bombarded with bourgeois ideology literally everywhere we turn. It takes channels like this and others like it and parties and organizations representing the same kinds of values and principles um, to get out there. And we're just we're not out there in anywhere near the same numbers currently, although we're trying to build that up. But yeah, so a lot of people, you know, get influenced uh, by that. It's not to say that every like last person, you know, who's ever voted Democrat is going to like go fascist in the end. But the people who are like hardcore about capitalism. Yeah. Yeah, they definitely uh, definitely will. Actually, you know, along these lines, we just mentioned Trump and we mentioned uh, fascism. Let me mute for a second because I got an engine. While I do that, I'm going to bring out a video file. Damn, so where did I put it? I had a Trump thing. Trump apparently is announcing that he's got some major news coming uh, tomorrow. And let me just see where I put this thing. Here we go. All right. So meanwhile, in the far right, here's what's going on. There we go. America needs a superhero. Yeah, so apparently that was real. Uh, Trump posted that on Truth Social. We'll see what the news is tomorrow. I'm sure it's going to be um, just great. Just great. I'm sure it'll be fantastic news. But anyway, um, we were talking about anti-fascism and somebody was asking in the last stream, how do you start doing anti-fascist stuff in general? So I started um, pulling some resources on that because I think this would be sort of a good series to get into and um, started just by pulling up this uh, this is a very basic um, one. 
Anti-Fascist Toolkit, An Introduction to Anti-Fascism by Rose City Antifa. Uh, I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be back in less than a minute, and then we will read this together. All right. That's our, our midway through the stream break. We don't always take a midway through the stream break, but, but we did today. <clears throat> so, yeah, this is going to be pretty basic. We can continue this in um, future videos, looking at other pamphlets on conducting anti-fascist uh, research and organization. Now, a lot of this is um, more from an anarchist perspective, because why? So there are certain kinds of anarchists like platformists that kind of emphasize um, particular kinds of structure of organizing uh, more directly. But a lot of it is more kind of scattershot and this and that, whereas something Marxist would probably be more likely to be happening through a party. That said, I mean, something like a Rose City Antifa is, you know, coalition involving people from various organizations. I thought this pamphlet was a pretty good. And like I said, we'll continue from there. But um, we do have various resources about organizing on the channel. If you go to the S4A YouTube channel and search on organize or search on organizing also, you will turn up various um, guides on, on organizing. So anyway, just continuing in that vein, let's get into this pamphlet. So introduction. We wrote this zine in spring of 2021 in the immediate wake of the Trump presidency, the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, and the mass Black Lives Matter uprisings against police brutality. Over the last year, it's been heartening to us to see so many people identifying themselves as anti-fascists. While individuals and groups may have their own definitions of anti-fascism, we've created this zine as a guide for new anti-fascists or for those who have just learned the term in order to provide Rose City Antifa's answer to the question, what is anti-fascism? Rose City Antifa breaks anti-fascist work into three main categories, direct action, solidarity work with other liberatory groups, and community education. All these tactics build upon each other to create a world free of fascist ideology. The historical roots of anti-fascism. <coughs> anti-fascism as an organized movement began in Europe in the 1920s, first in Italy in a response to the rise of Benito Mussolini's dictatorship, and then throughout Europe as a response to the growing Axis influence and the increasing threat of ethnic cleansing. In 1932, the Communist Party of Germany, KPD, established anti-fascistisch uh, action as a militant wing united against the fascist influence in their country. <clears throat> the double flag logo used by the KPD is still used today in anti-fascist organizing. In the United States, the contemporary iteration of anti-fascist action began in the 1980s with anti-racist action. ARA had a lot of crossover with the punk scene and disrupted white supremacist gangs in street-level confrontation and in subcultural spaces like music venues. Other historical examples of anti-fascist organizing were the Slovene and Croat group TIGR in Italy, Arditi del Popolo during Mussolini's rule, the Spanish anarchists during the Spanish Civil War, and resistance movements in France, the UK, Scandinavia, and Poland during World War II. Rose City Antifa was founded in Portland in 2007 out of an ad hoc coalition formed to disrupt the neo-Nazi Hammerfest music festival. Building on ARA's opposition to street-level white supremacy, RCA broadened the scope of anti-fascist work to disrupting not only neo-Nazi skinheads, but also the far right's ability to organize, recruit, and spread their ideology. Rose City was the first group in the United States to adopt the name Antifa, which had previously only been used by European anti-fascists, and better reflected a commitment to confronting fascism at every level of society. You know, and again, talking about all this, um, you know, the sort of the far left and the far right and Trump and all this, you got Democrats in the middle espousing some sort of uh, anti-fascism. Again, this is mealy-mouthed. The Democrats are fascist collaborators claiming to be anti-fascist. You can't trust them at all. And going back to the earlier themes of we need to pull a lot more of the U.S. left out of the jaws of the Democratic Party. This is exactly what I'm talking about. And here's an organization that is actually 
you know, moving in a more effective anti-fascist direction. Anti-fascist organizers come from a variety of different backgrounds and political ideologies. Often there is crossover between anti-fascist ideology and anarchism, Marxism, communism, and feminism. However, it's not always true that because someone identifies as, say, an anarchist, they are anti-fascist. Sometimes within leftist political ideologies, there can also be exclusionary or damaging values connected to them. For example, rhetoric used by radical feminists can be co-opted by trans-exclusionary radical feminists, or TERFs, transphobes. And anarcho-primitivist talking points can be co-opted by eco-fascists attempting to use environmentalism as an entry point to leftist circles. Be careful of conflating anti-fascism with other movements both so we don't dilute good work and so we don't excuse bad behavior. The Torch Points of Unity Today, many anti-fascist groups in the United States are part of the Torch Network, which is a loose anti-fascist coalition, but adheres to agreed points of unity in their work. One, we disrupt fascist and far-right organizing and activity. Two, we don't rely on the cops or courts to do our work for us. This doesn't mean we never go to court, but the cops uphold white supremacy and the status quo. They attack us and everyone who resists oppression. We must rely on ourselves to protect ourselves and to stop the fascists. Three, we oppose all forms of oppression and exploitation. We intend to do the hard work necessary to build a broad, strong movement of oppressed people centered on the working class against racism, sexism, nativism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, homophobia, transphobia, and discrimination against the disabled, the oldest, the youngest, and the most oppressed people. We support uh, abortion rights and reproductive freedom. We want a classless, free society. We intend to win. Four, we hold ourselves accountable personally and collectively to live up to our ideals and values. Five, we not only support each other within the network, but we also support people outside the network who we believe have similar aims or principles. An attack, <clears throat> excuse me, an attack on one is an attack on all. Types of anti-fascist work. Direct action. A central part of anti-fascist work is directly confronting fascists and making sure that they don't have a platform to organize. In the event that far-right groups gather in public, anti-fascists should do what they can to disrupt them. Rallies bring together coalitions of people who believe in anti-fascist work and disrupt events where fascists gather. For example, a rally countering the Proud Boys on August 17, 2018, brought together thousands of people in Portland to directly counter the fascist incursion into the city. Sometimes rallies are confrontational, but sometimes it's a chance for allies to connect and share resources. On September 26, 2020, leftist groups gathered in Peninsula Park to table, info share, and listen to speakers. At the time, there was a Proud Boys rally happening in Delta Park, but the community's energy was better spent building resilience by connecting with one another. So these are tactical and strategic moves that the movement makes on a case-by-case -case basis based off of what they know. What is an anti-fascist protest? While anti-fascists can and should support actions that push us toward collective liberation, RCA narrowly defines anti-fascist protests as coordinated events taken to oppose the insurgent right wing. Actions whose goal is to oppose the state, capitalism, or other oppressive structures would be more accurately described as anti-capitalist, anti-authoritarian, or another term. Education. As anti-fascists, much of our work involves educating our communities about the threats of fascists, ways to resist that threat, and making people aware of who in their neighborhood is dangerous. Examples of community education could be holding a training on how to recognize prominent hate symbols or fascist rhetoric, or publishing zines or materials on subjects related to anti-fascism. We can't do this work without the support of the community. Anti-fascists' work to educate our communities is supported by a large body of research on far-right agitators. Often, fascists, neo-Nazis, and others on the far-right do a lot of their work and conversation online. Anti-fascist research involves checking prominent far-right forums and websites and monitoring activity. So comment, this was in the wake of the Jimmy Dore Boogaloo thing. Uh, there was a lot of shit that came out about uh, the Boogaloos at that time 
and it was really repulsive stuff. As far as I know, that, that never got walked back uh, by Dorp. But anyway, tying people's online or secret political opinions to their real world activities is what creates consequences for Nazis. It's important to maintain a very high standard of research and evidence so that innocent people don't get mistakenly identified as fascists and so that evidence we provide in a docs is irrefutable. Solidarity. Although the scope of anti-fascist work is narrow, anti-fascists broadly support those who are working towards liberation. Solidarity with black, indigenous, trans, queer, disabled, poor, immigrant, and other marginalized identities is a central part of sustaining our work. It's important to learn the history of this solidarity work within our movement, both the stories of success and examples of when we fell short. The work of anti-fascism supports others in their struggles against oppression. So you can see some pamphlets there, zines on the Danish resistance movement, one titled Not Your Grandfather's Anti-Fascism, another one titled Beating Fascism, uh, another one Anti-Fascist Action something or other. There's a lot of stuff out there if you just look, you know, search on um, Antifa zine or Anti-Fascist zine, you'll find a lot of stuff. And again, we will cover more on the channel. Why We Remain Anonymous Anti-fascist organizers remain anonymous because we investigate activity from people who are capable of violence and harm, and may have enacted it in the past, and because of the real possibility of state repression. In the United States, prominent leftist organizers, including members of the labor movement, communist movement, abortion rights advocates, and black liberation activists, have been targeted by the state and arrested, prosecuted, disappeared, or murdered. Practicing good security culture keeps us and our comrades safe. It's better to err on the vigilant side than to be underprepared. Anonymity also means that no one of us gets the clout or social capital associated with doing anti-fascist work. We operate as a collective, united by the common goals of defending our community and defeating fascism. And then they have links here for further information about our organizing. Visit us at our website, rosecityantifa.org. If you have any or information about racist or fascist organizing in your area, you can email us at tips at rosecityantifa.org. And that's the end of that. Like I said, um, you know, pretty broad introductory pamphlet. And uh, we will continue with that. So I have some more articles um, that I pulled for today. But let's dive back into the chat for a little bit. Speaking, has anyone, uh, so going back, um, on, any, has, blah, blah, has anyone actually tried reading Rothbard? It honestly hurts, like painfully dumb. So this is Murray Rothbard, um, a major libertarian figure. He's the, um, a fully free market would have a thriving um, trade in children. He's the guy who had that quote. Um, yeah, I, I've listened to some audio of his lectures and things like that. Uh, the one where he called Marx a quote commie brilliant anyway um, <laughs> yes painfully dumb indeed another comment speaking of libertarians there's some dude I knew from high school a long time ago who I see posting when I occasionally get on my Facebook account and he says and posts some solid uh, says and posts some solid stuff but then decides to call himself a libertarian I almost guarantee he knows nothing about libertarianism or any other right-wing BS Class, class unconsciousness is a massive pain in the ass to get around uh, with some people. Yeah, and this is, you know, something that I got uh, initially when I was sizing up libertarianism before I really knew what it was. Um, it sounds kind of badass at first. And even, you know, they stole their name from anarchists anyway. <laughs> like libertarianism around the world outside the United States does not mean this sort of ANCAP garbage. It does not mean like deregulated, you know, Ayn Rand type shit. Um, doesn't mean Ron Paul. It means like, you know, left anarchism, which as Marxists, obviously we have, um, you know, there's a lot of good, good hearted anarchists out there, but anarchism as an ideology uh, I think is severely flawed for reasons that we've discussed on the channel uh, many times previously. But that said, I mean, anarchists at least have a lot of the same stated goals of a communist, whereas a uh, right-wing libertarian, U.S.-style libertarian, absolutely does not. It is, again, more crypto-fascist. And um, 
this is what we were saying about fascism. It attempts to steal some of the thunder of, to ape some of the style of communism. It wants to sound revolutionary and, you know, energized and all this stuff. Um, that's because part of its purpose is literally being a decoy and pulling workers who are interested in some kind of change into a dead end. That's literally the fucking point of it. So, yeah, so exactly. I mean, your uh, friend, you know, hopefully you can talk some sense into him. Once people go pretty far down the libertarian rabbit hole, it can be a few years before they come up for air, unfortunately. And, you know, hopefully they don't, <clears throat> um, you know, go to unite the right rallies or anything in the meantime. But I mean, yeah, it can be like, it's definitely pretty insular. Um, and I think is especially targeted to people who have less education and less, uh, you know, they maybe haven't traveled as much or like less cultural exposure and things like that. <clears throat> because so much of libertarianism is kind of bullshit that like falls apart with even slight amounts of poking or common sense. But for people who have been raised in a more insular environment, and maybe didn't get much higher education, it can be harder to sort of, uh, you know, you can get, you, it's easier to get bamboozled by this and, and, uh, and that. I mean, you know, in fact, I was just looking at a study. Did I get the screenshot of this or not? Actually, this would be a decent time to uh, pull this up. Anyway, there's a thing about like low intelligence being a predictor of um, right wing and intolerant political views. But anyway, yeah, I mean, that said, <clears throat> you know, the the there's an initial impulse there of being angry, alienated about something. But again, the point of libertarianism is to take that impulse and make it harmless to capital and even harmful to labor. <clears throat> Hang on a sec. All right, clearing my throat a little more. Yes, thank you, mutated degeneration. I'm way behind the chat, that's fine. That was the word I was looking for. Americanism is just proto-Nazism. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of ultra-nationalism kind of thing. You know, Americanism, it's settler colonial nationalism. Um, and the U.S. is also like the center of global imperialism. There are other imperialist powers that the U.S. is in league with, for sure. Capital is global. But you, the U.S. is like the military arm of it. I mean... If it wasn't for the U.S., there probably would have been global communism by now. Like, it is the headquarters of reaction. The U.S. has been funding every, um, you know, extremely reactionary and fascist movement, uh, anti-communist movement forever. And they know it, you know. I mean, they're like, we're the last hope uh, for the world against socialism. And boy, are they really living up to that. <clears throat> China is now having its large COVID surge, and it's just ridiculous how Bloomberg is saying, quote, issues are how to remove the zero COVID policy, not the fact that there is a COVID surge now. Yeah. Um, was also just reading an article about this from where? Let me just bring it up. I have an entire COVID tab. Uh, where were we? Yeah, so this is from marketwatch.com. Uh, I don't have screenshots. I'll just read out some of it. We've covered stuff like this before, too, with like long COVID and equal labor shortage. Yeah, um, so a majority of people who get neurological long COVID symptoms, that is the brain fog, the fatigue, stuff like that, are unable to return to work. 59% according to one poll, 50% unable to do normal daily around the house stuff. But yeah, majority unable to work. So that's uh, one in six, even of fully vaccinated people get long COVID. And then even more uh, among the less vaccinated or, or non-vaccinated. And then um, a sizable percentage of those. So you get, let's say, 20% of all cases getting long COVID. A sizable percentage of that 20% getting neurological symptoms. And then 59% of them being unable to work. Okay, yeah. Anyway, so the Market Watch article, the um, 
This is from December 8th. The headline is, People are long social distancing due to COVID-19. Economists say that's contributing to a drop in labor force participation. Uh, labor participation, excuse me, labor force participation fell for the third month in a row in November as 13% of U.S. workers say they will continue social distancing and another 45% say they will do so in limited ways. This is by Zoe Hahn. Um, I'll read more of this later in the next COVID update. But they're really trying to blame people who are trying to not get long COVID and, uh, for, you know, for this. Um, could we have better social policy that would be somewhat more inconvenient to capital up front, but would actually protect the integrity of the population, workforce, etc. in the long term? Yeah, we could, but everything's about the next quarter's profits, and that's what's driving all of the decisions in policy. So continuing, COVID minimizers, deniers, etc., all act like our immune system is this perfect thing. Like, no. <laughs> um, um, yeah, no, the, our immune system can definitely be damaged and suppressed by a wide variety of things. Not getting enough sleep will suppress your immune system, but also viruses and things like that can definitely suppress your immune system. Um, ever heard of HIV? You know, there's, there's a good example. Now, it's relatively hard to catch HIV compared to a COVID. You know, HIV is not airborne. <clears throat> but um, COVID sure as fuck is. So that's mask up. N95, N99, KN94, KN95, what's it? KF94, P100, all of these high grade masks, you need them. The cloth masks don't cut it, even the surgical don't cut it because they don't make a seal around your mouth and nose. So what do we have here? I fell in with the Jimmy Dore crowd for that reason because he was so anti-Democrats. The squad is not our friends and he seemed to be the only one shooting straight and proving it with experiments like force the vote. He later lost me by being so unprincipled in his quote leftism, proving himself to be an opportunistic class collaborator and traitor. Yeah, I mean, if you go back to 2015, 2016, Jimmy Dore, there was a lot more progressivism there. Uh, I mean, he, he had flaws then too, but it was a lot more sort of honest progressive. After his split with TYT over Hillary Clinton, he needed an audience and like he got really, um, you know, he took some of the TYT audience with him, which is where he started. Um, but because I think he really wanted to make a lot of money and mainly show up jank, he wanted to um, build this big audience. And, you know, he took some of the left leaning people who felt that, you know, endorsing Hillary was selling out and stuff like that. But that wasn't enough. So he had to go to keep the audience building after libertarians and MAGA people. And he did. And you can see it in uh, the way that he started moving away from progressive positions and towards libertarian and fascist ones. And that, you know, took a few years to fully uh, manifest. And I think that he did believe in things like Medicare for all and things like that. But as we've said before, you know, like 70% of the country supports Medicare for all. It's not even like a left wing position at this point. Um, I mean, it's left of the Democrats and Republicans. It's left of capital. But I mean, it is a mainstream opinion at this point. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he would he would call out the um, sellout Democrats. And then he absolutely wound up cozying up to the right wing because one of two things happened. You go left of the Democrats and then you actually go into Marxism, which is the only really left position. Or you wind up circling back around and you go to the, quote, populist right. In other words, the fake left, fascism. And that's absolutely what he's been doing. And it was like literally like the next week or two after Force the Vote that he came out with the uh, Boogaloo thing. That's why I call it the uh, last dying gasp of his progressivism, because literally like a week or two after he's... Um, doing an infomercial for a uh, racist libertarian militia. So, yeah. Yeah, we're trying to build the Marxist left here. Um, and I think as it grows and people do get more of a working understanding of communism versus fascism 
and versus liberalism. Um, you know, we'll be able to <clears throat> have people just, uh, you know, the, the boots on the ground will be able to take this stuff apart in minutes and fewer people will get sucked into it. Because I'll tell you, you know, like 15 years ago, it was just, um, things were just a lot less, uh, the, the, the lines were not as clearly drawn in the sand. And I think it's getting a lot, it's coming into sharper relief these days. So we, we absolutely need to help people in that process. I was big into Dorr for a while because he was the only anti-imperialist sock dem and supported Castro, Chavez, etc. Yeah, and again, you know, that was, uh, I think he found that the bigger money was, was with MAGA and libertarians. So he got into the Tulsi Gabbard train and, uh, you know, had Ron Paul on his show and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, it, far from a principled leftist. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to be like, hey, supporting Hillary Clinton is not... <laughs> the be all end all and probably not even um you know a good thing at all yeah that didn't really take a genius but like where did he go from there well he wasn't a marxist he wasn't interested in learning marxism still hasn't and now he's currently circling the larouche drain with um jack off hinkle you know as a regular guest on his channel and door cozying up to these um you know insane right-wingers neo-fascists and, you know, again, I mentioned how he did the infomercial for uh, the Boogaloo guy back almost two years ago. Um, I think it was February 2021. More recently, and we covered this, I think, in live streams number 48 and 49, he was stumping for Georgia Maloney, lifelong, 30-year-long fascist in, in Italy. Um, she's been fascist all of her adult life, member of fascist parties like the successor to Mussolini's party. You got somebody who's since age 15 been involved directly with fascism and the head of the youth leagues and all that kind of stuff. And he's like playing video over and he's like, huh, doesn't sound that bad. You know, how is that fascist? Well, if you can't understand how somebody who's been a fascist for 30 years is fascist, I think you're just trying to mislead people. But yeah, I mean, I remember, um, you know, there was sort of consensus for a while there until doors started really breaking uh, into the extreme far right stuff that, you know, he was like one of the better of that crowd. I think that that was absolutely, you know, mistaken at this point. And he clearly kept going uh, further and further to the right, like the extreme right at this point. Lots of comments on Trotskyism. Uh, Trotskyists in Italy are fun. In documents, they greet each other with Trotskyist greetings. They all, they're also kicked from the new Fourth International for quoting Gramsci and then defended Gramsci by saying he was actually a Trotskyist. I love them, my favorite cult. Trotskyists are fucking ridiculous. Um, you know, as we mentioned in the Kashama Sawant thing, like she at least managed to write the article without like mentioning Stalinism. But... Um, yeah, it's pretty ridiculous and uh, not uh, not not a constructive trend. Trotskyists were the first real life socialists I met, and literally turned me off to socialism for a number of years. So yeah, yeah, they are such a fringe group; they don't deserve to be debunked. I agree. I think uh, you know we will. Uh, the rest of the movement will wind up leaving Trotskyists in the dust. They're so sectarian, and they so do not get along with anyone else uh they they debunk themselves they just out themselves immediately um there was a video i saw which unfortunately i'll you know I'll look at it again maybe they've um made it public again it was like this video it was a presentation in the uk where there's like a lot of trotskyism a lot of trotskyist parties organizations and uh and other things but they had a great uh, rundown on it. Unfortunately, there was like a lot of background noise in the video. It was a live presentation. There was like a really loud fan going. Anyway, the video, I went to find it again and it was marked private, which was very disappointing. But in the presentation, it was like a PowerPoint. They showed that at one point there were as, as many fourth internationals as there were Trotskyist parties. And they show the growth of these over time. <laughs> it's like exponential. So, you know, Trotskyists don't like, uh, you know, the color shirt another Trotskyist is wearing. They split and form a new party 
and then a new international to go with it. Um, yeah. What we really want is control should be given to the workers' councils and social organizations, but control should go to the government is a huge shift in consciousness that we can work with. Yeah, it is at least a shift away from neoliberalism. So, um, you know, we're Marxists, we're going to take this as far as we can. Uh, it would be a step up even to go back to social democracy from this. However, you know, the conditions of capitalism, the falling rate of profit, it's unclear whether we even can go back to social democracy at this point, whether that would be at, at all amenable to capitalists at all, um, as capitalism be, gets thinner and thinner, the profits get thinner and thinner. Um, you know, those, those 20th century paydays just are not here anymore for them. And uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. But yeah, it is, it is a shift in people's consciousness away from neoliberal propaganda, yes. Uh, most people still believe that private enterprise is literally better in every respect than any government. And yeah, I agree with you. Getting them at least not to believe that is a step up, be, you know, to then maybe four or five years down the line, you know, becoming a communist. Although there's a, a lot of work along the way. So, yeah, even stepping away from, uh, you know, neoliberal ideology, that would be a step up for sure. Forgot where I was. Um... I think you got to go behind what is considered politics and go after masses. Oh, you know what? Actually, before I um, get onto this comment, what we really want is control should be given to the workers, councils, and social organizations. Yeah, it would help if we had them. So that's kind of my point about getting out there and doing the organizing, meeting the left that we have, networking, making yourself available, finding the projects. Uh, if we don't build the workers' councils, we can't give control to the workers' councils. So there's, there's a lot of work here that needs to be done, really a lot. Anyway, I think you gotta go behind what is considered politics and go after masses who are an organization that control masses among workers, they have family, work, and religion. Um, so I think you mean like the other institutions in society. So like family is an institution, uh, workplaces, religion. Uh, there are people who are radical but don't participate in politics and those people are willing to learn anything, especially under the guise of self-help, that can uh, improve their life. Capitalist bureaucracy challenges the individual, or challenges the individual. Socialist, uh, well, I wouldn't say bureaucracy, organization frees the individual. Regulation should deburden individuals. In other words, it should be done with an eye towards uh, collective liberation. Yeah, I agree with you. And um, there are plenty of people who are apolitical, who definitely um, would be, you know, may have fewer obstacles to getting involved in a socialist effort than would say, you know, a dedicated reactionary for sure. I think the large majority of the working class have no real revolutionary spirit, at least in Germany or especially in Turkey. From what I saw, they're too uneducated and blinded from the media. So this is what we were talking about with bourgeois ideology being prevalent everywhere and many workers picking it up this is something we have to fight against and you just have to look for every little point you can possibly leverage and go after it this is part of being a skilled agitator and then you lead from the agitation into education and then organization so but yeah we, we we're up against like a trillion dollar machine putting out capitalist propaganda daily um on the other hand if they stop doing there's a reason they're dumping so much money into it they have to they have to keep propagandizing people or, you know, the, the trance would break. We can definitely help with that. And, and this is something we need to be seeking out opportunities to do constantly. I'm in DSA and just signed that letter. Thanks for sharing S4A. Thank you for signing it. You're in. All right. Welcome. Piece of work. Wages aren't everything in the union, but pretty much everything that helps workers will hurt profitability, quote unquote. I know the one thing people at my job wish 
for is having democratic control over the ability to turn off orders from Grubhub, Uber Eats, and other apps when we are understaffed. The general manager doesn't even have this ability. The district manager can, but they never do, and they never work shifts in stores. So they're completely separate from the reality on the, uh, the kitchen floor there. Um, it seems like such a small thing, but this type of stuff really makes or breaks people. I feel mental health is built on the idea of chemical imbalances is wholly sufficient to explain our lived anxiety and depression. Our brains do not exist in a vat. Our brains and bodies are constantly med mediated in a society where work and home are shaped by policies in work and in government by people who want you to shut up and put out to make a few guys rich without a care for your self-actualization. Healing in general is predicated on agency, which no one has when our shelter, food, water, and lights can be taken away from us in this cohesive mess we call life. Yeah, well, that's alienation. Is like we're alienated from our labor power, and um, then, you know, basic necessities have been commodified, and we have to work for wages to be able to get uh, the money to, to buy basic um, you know, food and shelter and things like that. But about what you said about uh, mental health bait, built on the idea of chemical imbalances, insufficient to explain our lived anxiety and depression. So in the world of counseling and therapy and, uh, you know, things related to that, um, there is the idea of a biopsychosocial model of mental health and well-being. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of the times, you know, some people would say that this has gotten turned into the bio, bio, bio model. In other words, the psychological aspects and the social aspects have been kind of replaced with the drive, um, you know, just for a biological approach to health. Now, there are areas within mental health where the um, biological view is supported by really strong research. Um, for example, schizophrenia definitely seems to have um, biological components to it. And if you want to treat that successfully, that has to be addressed. Um, there's other things where, you know, it's much more on the psychosocial side. So, um, you know, where there's a lot of really solid evidence behind, um, you know, like a dialectical behavioral therapy and uh, you know other kinds of interventions for people which are not biological in nature. Uh, so yeah, I mean, biology plays a role for sure in, in um, people's uh, health and mental health. I mean, we tend to break the mind off from the body. The mind is, arises from the body. Um, some organs arguably more than others, but um, yeah, you know, that, that distinction is, is a bit of a, uh, a, a misnomer. Um, or, a, or a false one. But yeah, I mean, I think that we can, and there are people who are developing a more holistic um, approach to health that involves a lot more of, uh, you know, social and multicultural view of what is affecting a person's experience. And, um, you know, of course, uh, trying to, as you said, people having agency uh, is well, healing in general is predicated on agency. In other words, people making choices for ourselves and, um, you know, uh, living the life, not, not just in like a libertarian sense, like, you know, uh, leave me alone, let me do what I want, but um, in a sense of people being self actualized and things like that definitely leads to greater contentment and things like that, broadly speaking. So, yeah. Um, Good comment. I kind of want Trump to beat DeSantis in the primaries after that recent news on DeSantis being a disgusting torturer. Uh, both are worse. I'm not sure there's uh, I'm not sure there's a good guy in that fight. There isn't. It's Trump's announcement that he's actually Superman. Yeah. All right. What else do we have here? I, 
I was in the Bundestag and they had a place with sh this is a German uh, government building and they had a place with shelves that had names written on it it was a memorial but they had people that were members of the Nazis I asked the tour guide but he couldn't answer <laughs> Jesus anti-revolutionary fascist miseducation as well as revolutionary anti-fascist education simplified as a blame game everyone knows things are bad and miserable but only a revolutionary can steer people away from blaming just one of the political parties or the government or yeah any other group um, and uh, hit at the mark in targeting struggle against those who are responsible the one percent simultaneously saving those groups that would be targeted if fascism gains a foothold. Yeah, so I mean, basically the thing that fascism tries to do is replace class struggle with some other kind of struggle, racial struggle, national struggle, something like that. As Marxists, we constantly need to th bring things back around to class struggle. There's like so much opportunism and revisionism done in the name of like basically putting class struggle down on a second or third tier and you need to fight that constantly because they're constantly trying to do it to us and dog whistles people need to learn what dog whistles are used a lot of people think that they can get dog whistles when the whole point is that cishet and white people cannot hear them only the marginalized and the fascists can like one good example where two groups came together to fight against their oppression was when the united farm workers under caesar chavez united with the Filipino groups to hold a great boycott and a strike. Um, yeah. Yes, libertarians are barely crypto-fascist. Increasingly, um, the libertarian to fascist pipeline is just above ground and completely open. But this is what I call the far right global convergence. All of these far right forces are just, um, you know, they're pulling in members wherever they can and all the rhetoric is just getting more and more extreme. And again, you have these liberals in the middle who basically um, are blocking the left with everything they have while claiming to be anti-fascist. Now, if you're anti-fascist, you'd be working with the left to crush the right but you don't want to do that or rather the people who fund both the democrats and the republicans which is the same people by and large uh don't want that because if the republicans were out of the picture then the democrats would have to seriously contend with the left as competitors and they don't fund us so that's the last thing that they want the libertarian solution to everything is more contracts yeah basically um just Whoever has power uses that power to get more power. Whoever doesn't have power gets, you know, like railroaded by those that do. And so, yeah, contracts, contract law, no standing law. Just basically make agreements between individuals and parties and just have courts like enforce the contracts. Absolutely. That's what a lot of crypto shit says. They, oh, like cryptocurrency. They literally say things like X coin is the revolution and shit, essentially fascism. Yeah, how about Bitcoin losing two thirds of its value? Awesome. Good stuff. Very revolution. We'll see, you know, where uh, Bitcoin ends up. But well, there's nothing communist about that at all. Okay, so coming back around to the person who got screwed on the union leadership thing. They say, I'm not sure on the bylaws thing, but I've been pointing out to my coworkers how arbitrarily deciding to hold another election because the guy who got the job would act as an activist steward to make their lives better is inherently unfair. And it shows the reason why we need new leadership. I've also been going around to each coworker since before the original date of the election, uh, asking what they would like to see from a steward and taking notes. It sounds like you're off to a very good start. A lot of these guys know that I have their back and during the last few contract meetings for the shop, uh, I'm missing a word here, during the last few contract meetings for the shop was something if the few guys who stood up to the contract, the union president was heavily pushing, 
which would have gotten rid of seniority rights and would have added a management rights clause that would have busted our union. And I rallied enough no votes to get it out of there, despite them trying to get us to vote on essentially the same contract three separate times. All I can hope is that they don't rig it. Yeah, I mean, if that's a concern that you have, which I think is justified, um, try to put together an election in integrity committee if you can. Uh, and yeah, absolutely rally as much support as you possibly can. Uh, you know, take uh, take note of what percentage of support you have. If the elections come up, um, you know, uh, like way out of whack with that, definitely raise a stink about it. I think fascism was created as a byproduct of bourgeois politics, like the truth behind the lie is they have some consciousness but do not see that the bourgeoisie uh, work against them. Well, I mean, we, we can go back to writings like Clara Zetkin and Gramsci and others who wrote in the 20s and 30s about fascism. Uh, there's a playlist on the channel which is Understanding Fascism and Right-Wing Socio-Political Economic Movements. You can read all about it there. Um, they don't have the kind of consciousness you're thinking of. They are completely against class struggle and they're there to mislead people and to serve reaction. So, yeah. As I've said here before in the past, probably now, no, no, you're fine. I'm one of those people with neurological damage from long COVID and yeah, just living in general working, hobbies, exercising, socializing, resting, etc., are all affected. The person I am today health-wise is very different from how I was just about two years ago before being infected. Yeah, uh, I mean, people get seizures uh, as part of long COVID. Like, it can be very, very bad. Um, I was really severely impacted. I believe I got COVID in uh, mid-December, like a year ago. No, two years ago. Uh, mid-December 2020 after being really strict about um, you know my exposure I kind of um, went into a setting that was just packed with unmasked people and before I even knew like before I could even get out of there um, I, I think that's where I got COVID I was wearing a mask but like I think I was just around too many exposed uh, or unmasked people at a time when there was a surge and yeah, I was severely impacted. It kind of cleared up about 11 months later for me. And, uh, but I'm, I'm still not probably 100%, but I, I feel significantly more normal. But yeah, I was like for 11 months, it was, it was really bad. There's something to be said that any exploration of progressive or left or populist politics without a thorough Marxist class analysis will end you up in fascism. Yeah, that's what I was saying before, that basically anything not nailed down to Marxism is going to get blown away by the fascist uh, winds. And even then, some of the fascists are trying to call themselves Marxist. Look at, for example, you know, Caleb Maupin or some, somebody like that uh, that's really all about Dugan and LaRouche, uh, neo-fascist shit, but they're trying to pass themselves off as socialist at least some of the time. So, yeah. Bourgeoisie don't care about nationality. They're imperialists who want to own everything, including our thoughts. Well, so, I mean, they understand that, um, you know, capital works globally, and they're certainly international in their organizing and in their approach to the world, but they use nationalism as a way of uh, dividing workers off from each other. And, uh, you know, of course, um, there's different legal jurisdictions and things like that, which sometimes come into play in their negotiations and wars. But yeah, I mean, nationalism, that was a feature of early capitalism, which now is just um, really an illusory tool that is used against workers to um, divert class consciousness towards um, nationalism and, and support for the capitalists. And yeah, the petty bourgeoisie do believe in nationalism, fairly sincerely, a lot of them. They believe in a reactionary nationalism as a way to prop up their political power 
and this must be materially realized in an imperialist social democracy. Yeah, so I mean, that's um, this is why the reactionary petty bourgeoisie is like a lot of the sort of um, boots on the ground support for fascism. Uh, of course, again, they're being led around by the nose by the big capitalists who really control the uh, major raw materials and transportation lines globally. So the petty bourgeoisie are really an appendage to the system of the big bourgeoisie. Um, as somebody said, libertarians, and you know, this goes for other reactionary petty bourgeois as well, are much like house cats, uh, very convinced of their own independence, but in fact very dependent on an artificial environment that um, you know they don't control at all. That uh, people who you know, have opposable thumbs and can turn doorknobs actually control. So, um, no offense to cats, though, uh, whatsoever. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's the same kind of uh, the, the libertarians don't want to see they're not really in charge. They want to pretend that they are. And again, it's like this ideology from an earlier stage of capitalism, before capital was so consolidated and you know, it was possible to just strike out and get rich. Those days are long gone, and boy, are they mad. They know on some level that they're long gone. And uh, boy, are they mad about it. And uh, they can't really do anything about it. You know, the capitalists, their system is going to one conclusion, more and more consolidation. You can't turn it backward, not really. So you're either for the big bourgeoisie, um, you know, just getting more and more condensed into the 1% of 1%. Or you're for the proletariat that wants to take the system the next step and, uh, you know, abolish private property as a system. But as far as just breaking it up into, uh, you know, 1930s ascendant capitalism, it's just not going to happen. comments here. Yeah, it's true that mental illnesses can manifest different. Sometimes there are cultural components to the expression of mental illness. Like schizoph schizophrenia occurs in, it's, it's just, it's like it's something that happens to humans. It's, you know, something about our biology that's just like one of the things that can go wrong with our biology but yes yeah, some of the manifestations can be um culturally influenced this is especially the case with things like eating disorders and things like that um or like the way that depression and sadness or mourning uh like bereavement can manifest in different cultures sometimes has like a decidedly different um cultural stamp Yeah, so like there will be, you know, in the case of schizophrenia, if people have um, hallucinations of voices, what the voices are, like the particular flavor, what kind of characters they take on, can be culturally influenced. Yeah. I mean, that said, there are still a lot of other uh, problems like catatonia and other things that occur with schizophrenia. But yeah. All right. So we are caught up with the chat and, you know, I was thinking of maybe going into another article, but um, I think we'll actually leave it there for today. I'm not sure if I'm going to stream tomorrow or not. I'm actually going to be working on another kind of S4A related uh, project um, also on Thursday. So I may or may not be back for a stream. We will definitely have more um, audiobooks coming up on the channel. I uploaded two like half hour audiobooks from Lennon uh, yesterday and this morning. There will be more of those coming as well, as well as stuff from the Homeless Industrial Complex Reader and just all kinds of stuff. I have several lines of um, audiobooks going. We will finish Engels anti during part one. Basically, there's a bunch of uh, shorter Lennon ones I want to do. There's the remaining chapters of anti during part one. And there's the Homeless Industrial Complex Reader, as well as a few other things sprinkled in. So those are kind of the lines that I have open right now. Uh, also, there's a COVID update coming in the not-too-distant future and things like that. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, I appreciate everybody who showed up today. 
your comments help make these streams and discussions what they are. I mean, I, I pull the articles and stuff, make sure we have stuff to talk about and to respond to people's questions and to elaborate on different points. But, you know, a lot of this is just sort of open discussion. It's kind of like in a class you have the readings and then you meet together for a few hours and, uh, you know, have your discussions and things. We do the audio books uh, at other points throughout the week and then we come together, have the chat. And uh, anyway, it's working out pretty well so far. So like I said, I'll, I'll post an announcement as to whether I'm streaming on Thursday or not. Uh, so look on Twitter or maybe the uh, YouTube community tab or the Patreon. I usually post it in all three places for that. But um, otherwise, yeah, thanks to everybody who showed up. And thanks to everybody who could make it. I know a lot of people are showing up late because they couldn't get here uh, sooner. But uh, thanks also to the people commenting on YouTube. And uh, we'll see you in the next video.